What I'd like to do is talk to you about targeted therapy for lung cancer 2009 and give you a couple of examples. This is my disclosure slide. Probably the most important disclosure here is to tell you that I am a partial patent holder for EGFR testing from Genzyme, and that is relevant to my presentation. I don't believe these are necessarily relevant, but this is something you should be aware of as we go forward. So where are we in lung cancer? How do we do in taking care of people with advanced lung cancer? If one looks at using a good drug like gefitinib, but using it in the wrong circumstance, like in unselected patients, the drug looks like a bust. And when you look here at the intact one and intact two studies, which were randomized trials that looked at chemotherapy plus gefitinib in unselected patient populations, whether you use 250 or 500, didn't make a difference, not a scintilla of difference between these arms and between these curves, not a scintilla of difference. Unselected patients, drug failed to perform. What if you select patients? And this was an observation we made about four years ago. When you look at the time before gefitinib, I mean, patient before gefitinib, extensive disease in their right lung, amazing benefit after six weeks of ERISA. And this made us think there's something to this drug, even though when one looks at these curves, you can't see it. When you look at this patient, you know it's benefiting this patient. What was going on? I was very fortunate at the time to be working with a scientist by the name of Dan Haber. And the story behind this is quite funny. Dan called me up one morning after reading about one of my patients. So those of you who do public affairs read about one of my patients in the, in the Boston Globe and said, Tom, I think I know why your patient responded. They must have a kinase mutation. And I said, Dan, that sounds great. And he said, send me some samples. And the first sample I sent him was a woman named Kate, a 45-year-old mother of two from Connecticut, actually, um, who had metastatic lung cancer, treated with chemotherapy. Nothing worked. And it was November of 2002. Her tumor was progressing. She had a temperature of about 101 due to liver metastasis. She was admitted to the MGH, and she looked awful. This was her CT. And for those of you in the back, there's tumor here, tumor here, tumor here, a little bit, little bit of tumor there, and a little bit of tumor over here. So she had extensive liver metastatic disease. Uh, I don't know if Scott Gettinger's here, but the prognosis for a lung cancer patient who's got extensive liver metastatic disease, who's failed two types of chemotherapy, we're generally looking at about three, four months, particularly in 2002. January of 2003, after starting ERISA, near complete resolution, you just had this little tiny bit here. April 2003, clean CT scan. Dramatic benefit. In 2004, she continued to have this clean CT scan, and the Boston Globe wrote an article about her. And they said this, they called her a cancer miracle. Dan read the article. I'd love to tell you that this, this came from interactive grand rounds between basic scientists and clinicians, <laughs> where translational research was being discussed. No, it happened while he was having frosted flakes and, and, reading, and reading, the, uh, reading the Boston Globe. Uh, so in 2004, she continued on ERISA, a complete clinical response with just some mild side effects, and most importantly, having clinical benefit and living her life as a mother, a wife, and a friend, and a nurse as well, I should tell you. So these were the first nine patients we reported, eight of whom had, all of whom had great responses. Eight turned out to have kinase mutations in the kinase uh, uh, area of EGFR. And here is where we found the epidermal growth factor receptor uh, mutations. They tended to be either exon 19 deletions or exon 21 point mutations in the kinase domain. This gives you a summary of what the mutations look like. Again, a number of different exon 19 mutations account for about 45% of the mutations in this disease. Um, exon 21 mutations, the other 40%. And you know, there's a lot of debate. Most people think that exon 19 mutations do better. And most people will tell you, if you have exon 19 mutation, you're gonna have a better response. I'm not 100% convinced of that. I think it still may be that, there, that this is something that's still a little bit uncertain, but the, the, it, it could even, for the fellows, it could even pop up on the boards that exon 19 mutations do a little better in terms of, of uh, improved outcome. I want to point out the exon 20 point mutations, which we think are resistance mutations, often indicate resistance. The T790M being the most prominent, but, but uh, there are a number of other exon 20 resistance mutations. And when we see that, we get very concerned about the benefit of this potential drug working in this setting. So we had seen this retrospectively. We'd seen the drug work retrospectively. Does it work prospectively? And we designed a trial called the iTarget study where we would test the patients up front. Lo and behold, you test the patients up front and you increase the response rate. Patients did remarkably well. This paper was published last year in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. 
by my colleague, Dr. Alicia Sequist. We screened 98 patients. We found 35 mutations. Now, you might say that seems like a pretty good enrichment strategy. It was. We screened patients who had adenocarcinoma or patients who had uh, light or never smoking histories. Without a doubt, the biggest predictor is smoking history. Never smokers have a, a rate of mutation of about 20 to 30 percent in the U.S. As you all know, in Asia, and when I'm, when I'm talking about Asia, I'm talking Pacific Rim of Asia, the mutation rate is high. Mutation rate is probably 50 percent, and maybe even 60 to 70 percent in never smokers from Asia. 55 percent response rate in the study we published last year, 11 month median PFS, 21, th me 21 month median overall survival, showing, and these numbers are much, much better than I showed you from those survival curves that we started with. Most importantly, when you look at the 35 patients treated, this is a waterfall plot, you see that virtually everyone had some degree of tumor shrinkage. And for lung cancer, this is not something you would see as a typical, uh, typical waterfall plot. So again, right drug, right patient, right time, better outcome. So despite this, and there was ample reports from Asia similarly designed to what Leisha did and, and we did, and similar reports in Europe for better response, progression, free survival, and overall survival, there was an editorial written with this paper. And the editorial came out last summer, and the editorial basically said, um, despite these fantastic responses, uh, we must say that this is not ready for prime time. We need more proof. Because it could just be patient enrichment, and it could just be selection of patients who are destined to do better anyway. And that's why this paper, which appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine 10 days ago, is, I think, the most important paper to come out in lung cancer in quite some time. Of course, a paper that supports your bias would certainly be considered one of the most important papers to come out in some time. It also does support the concept of EGFR mutation testing, which I told you I have this partial patent on. So and I do have three kids who will need college education. So there, <laughs> there is another reason why I might think it's such a good paper. Um, but this was a phase three randomized trial done in Asia by Tony Mock. Uh, he's from Hong Kong. Many of the patients from Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Tokyo, uh, Korea, a few from mainland China, but mostly, mostly Japan and Korea contributed to this study. Randomized trial of Jafitinib, which is ERISA, versus chemo in clinically selected patients. This was the design. Again, I just refer you to the paper and the, and the editorial in the New England Journal just uh, 10 days ago. Jafitinib versus chemo with progression-free survival being the main endpoint because many patients would switch over if they got one first. So it didn't... Overall survival is a lot harder to look at when you have the switchover that occurs. So the Jafitinib group age, you see about 73% were under 65, 80% female, and 94% never smoked. So already, I agree, this is not the population from East Haven who comes in with, with lung cancer. This is a different kind of population. They're Asian, pretty much never smoking women. Okay? They exist, though, and they're an important population. And I think this describes the biology of the disease quite nicely. Um, and then the, all the other factors were well balanced between the two groups, which is important. So when you look at response rate, you see that the response rate to ERISA or Jafitinib was 43%. The response rate to chemotherapy was 32%. So the first look, well, there were more responses in the group that got chemotherapy. And when you looked at the primary endpoint, which is progression-free survival, that also favored Jafitinib compared to chemotherapy in this setting. And this is what the curve looked like. And when we first saw this, and this data came out about, I guess, nine months ago now, before the paper, you can see that initially the Jafitinib group does worse than the chemotherapy group, and then they cross and the Jafitinib group does better. Now, there's two things here. Number one is resistance is still a problem. The patient I showed you earlier might be, an ex might be the exception, not the rule. Resistance is a problem. Patients do relapse. Um, but it's better if you're picking just on clinical criteria long term to get ERISA, but it's probably worse short term to get ERISA. But when you look at the patients broken down by mutation, what you see is in the mutation positive patients, the response rate to uh, Jafitinib is 71%, response rate to chemo is 47 But if you don't have a mutation, the response rate is 1%. I would argue that's probably within the realm of the, of the sequencing error that could occur in looking at mutation positive or negative patients. Response rate to chemo is less as well. So what you see is, yes, Having mutation is a positive prognostic factor and probably enough of a positive prognostic factor that it makes difficult uh, assumptions about overall survival difficult to make in this setting. But the most important part is when you, the, the explanation for why the curves crossed. 
which is if you look at the mutation positive population, the ERISA group, if you have a mutation, does much better than the chemo group. If you look at the mutation negative population, the ERISA group does absolutely terribly. So my take home message from this actually was not to use more ERISA because if I have a patient where I can't mutation test for whatever reason, I actually am going to start with chemotherapy because the chemo, the mutation positive group does pretty well on the chemo, doesn't do terribly, gives you time to test for a mutation if you need to. Whereas if you don't have a mutation, you don't want to be giving ERISA as first line therapy. And this was the first example in a solid tumor of where targeted personalized therapy makes a difference for patients. There's also a lot of detail that appeared in the paper on quality of life, showing that symptoms were better managed and the quality of life was improved in this setting. So what about this concept of resistance? And what about the fact that we're not curing everybody with this disease? This is one of the patients on our study, patient treated down in Washington, D.C., patient who presented um, with, uh, with multiple lung nodules, had a great response, he had, came in with big masses, great response just down here. And you can see here evidence of these growing. And we isolated circulating tumor cells and found that he had the resistance mutation T790M. Second patient is a patient, actually that first patient was from Boston. The second patient is from Washington, D.C., who turned out to have amplification of the MET oncogene, which is a second mechanism of resistance. So what we're learning are that there's a number of mechanisms of resistance that explain why this drug doesn't work. Now this cartoon is a very nicely drawn cartoon that my colleague Jeff Engelman and Passiani put together and published last year in, in, uh, in can clinical cancer research. And if you just bear with me for a second, it gives you a sense of how complex this is going to be if we want to try to cure patients and how many different pathways we're going to need to inhibit. So if you look at the normal signaling, EGFR forms a partner with ERB3 and uh, phosphorylates, uh, uh, eventually phosphorylates AKT, gefitinib inhibits the kinase domain in this setting. So now if you introduce T790M, T790M prevents uh, gefitinib from effectively uh, inhibiting the kinase domain and you get signaling which now occurs uh, in this setting. So gefitinib directly inhibits the enzyme in this setting. Now MET amplification also becomes a second mechanism because if, in, well, if you go back this way, MET amplification becomes a second important mechanism of resistance because patients who are MET amplified will still be able to signal and activate PI3 kinase even in the presence of ERISA and gefitinib. Um, so that becomes an important mechanism of bypassing the gefitinib or, uh, or, or lotinib block that's placed on the tyrosine kinase in this setting. Uh, there are other ways that also impact this, such as IGFR, um, uh, insulin-like growth factor 1 receptor activation. And Jeff in, has been working on a, on, a, on a theory that anything that really can activate PI3 kinase is, um, is sufficient to induce uh, resistance in this setting. And one will have to think that if you really want to start thinking about curing this, that you're probably going to want to think about attacking this in several, several areas. You're going to want a drug which targets T790M in addition uh, to tar that you targets T790M in addition to targeting uh, the native receptor, and also one that blocks MET. We think MET's probably present in about 20% of resistant cases. And then also one that can take advantage of yet a third mechanism, which could be uh, something like IGF uh, activation in this setting as well. So ultimately, I think to cure patients in this setting, we're going to have to use multiple drugs as we go forward. So I think EGFDR mutation testing is ready uh, for prime time. The test can be done reliably on 10 unstained slides from a core biopsy. It can almost always come from a larger resection sample, and we're getting better at looking at it from a fine needle aspiration. A two to three week testing interval, I say, still remains a challenge. Um, it's tough to turn this around. And the biggest uh, problem is not with the laboratory. The biggest problem is getting the outside slides, getting the slides cut. They usually will not, most hospitals won't send you blocks. So you've got to get the actual uh, glass slides cut. I think rebiopsy of patients who initially respond can offer these uh, insight into this mechanism of resistance. So Vince Miller from Memorial Sloan Kettering presented terrific data at ASCO this year on their rebiopsy data and actually showed that T790M met amplification were important in a large number of patients and helped decide what you do next. If I know a patient's resistant because of met amplification, I'm going to try like hell to get them on a, I'm not sure if that's allowed by CME, I'm sorry. I'll try very hard to get them on a met amplification study, a trial of a met inhibitor 
in that setting. Whereas if it's T790M, you may try for one of the dual kinase inhibitors that might specifically target that. And then circulating tumor cells or circulating DNA might down the road give you a simpler or less invasive option as you go forward. I wanted to finish with one other example of of targeted therapy in lung cancer because I think it's such a compelling example. This is not yet published. Some of this data was, it actually is published this summer uh, in 2009 in JCO. There will be additional data which will be coming out when the phase one of this trial is published. But as we know, the EML4 ALK, the anaplastic lymphoma kinase translocation, was identified initially in Japan about two and a half years ago. And it's seen in about 20% of never smokers who don't have mutations. And what does that translate to? about 4% of lung cancer. So again, we're talking about relatively small niches. In the U.S., 10% have EGFR mutations, about 4% have eml 4 alk And compared to EGFR mutations, they're more likely to be men, and they're more likely to be about 10 years younger on average. That's a paper we had published just this summer. They don't respond to ERISA, but they do respond to chemotherapy fairly similarly. Paper that will be coming out soon, looking at the MET inhibitor, PF0234-1066 found a 55% response rate in patients who are harboring the EML4 ALK translocation. The reason I bring it up in a grand rounds form like this, if you are seeing or caring for a patient who's got an EGFR wild type tumor, who's not responding to Tarceva or Arisa and is never smoker, test them for EML4 ALK. And, uh, and, and, and Jeff can comment maybe later on where this testing will be available at Yale. It's available now at the Mass General. It's available at Memorial Sloan Kettering. We will have the fish available for it at Yale. The politics of whether that's done in lab medicine, genetics, or pathology, I haven't figured out. But we will have it available at Yale. Um, and I do think they should be screened for EML for ALK. There is a large randomized study that Scott Gettinger here at Yale is going to be involved with uh, comparing chemotherapy to the Pfizer inhibitor for those people who harbor this. And as I mentioned, Scott identified his first patient uh, just last week who carries the EML4 ALK uh, translocation. This is an example of immunoperoxidase for EML4 ALK, uh, for ALK, actually. And the only problem is occasionally it's, it's not necessarily um, uh, uh, related because you can have positive impacts even on patients who don't uh, have the translocation, who, but who just express ALK itself. This tells you a little bit about the drug Pfizer 0234-1066. It's a potent ATP competitive inhibitor of MET, but also gets ALK kinase. Uh, and this is the cytoplasmic fusion uh, protein variants. And the EML4 is what gives you lung cancer in this setting. Now, this is a patient of mine who was described on, um, on uh, World News Tonight. What you can see, her name is Linnea, fantastic woman, 48 years old, didn't respond to anything I treated her with. Amazing response just in about two months, dramatic benefit in her left lung, you see near clearing of all the disease present in the left lung. Remarkable benefit in terms of how she feels. This has been going on now for 14 months. She emailed me yesterday because I arranged for her to be a reviewer. For any of you submitting Department of Defense grants that have anything to do with lung cancer, she's on the review committee. Um, and, and she was delighted that she can become involved as a patient advocate on, uh, on a federal grant review committee. It tells you how well she's feeling and how uh, able she's feeling at this point. Again, just gives you another example of what this looks like. So I just wanted my last two slides is just to show you this is Kate CT from right before I left MGH. Seven years later, okay? 2009, dramatic benefit in terms of how she's doing. And so she continues in October of 2009, continues on ERISA. She continues with a complete clinical response, virtually no side effects. And the most important thing, her daughter is now captain of the field hockey team as a senior in high school. And her biggest issue is her son is not getting as much playing time as he should as a, a catcher on the Clark University baseball team. And when you get to having those kind of problems, that shows you how targeted therapy can help patients with lung cancer. Thank you very much.